My name is Mike Stanick. I am the state agronomist for NRCS. And most of you I know from various uh, past encounters in my Sauk County career and as an egg agent and with the Dairy Forage Research Center farm in Prairie de Sac, uh, where I managed a 2,000 acre facility, uh, production dairy, 425 milking cows, uh, about 1,000 acres of grain, alfalfa, alfalfa research, small grain research. No hemp on that farm, but a little Kernza we were playing with, so that's kind of fun. And that gives me uh, a pretty good background to be a state agronomist here because as, as an NRCS person at the state office, I am working with the conservation standards. So when we talk about 590, that's my baby. And uh, it's only 18 pages of really healthy reading. And uh, Sue and I work together on that. So that's what I'm doing in the state office. I'm happy to be here. And uh, this year uh, started about June when uh, Everybody was heading into preventive plant acres. It looked like uh, middle of late June was just going to be a disaster. And uh, finally, the sun did come out, and people were able to get some stuff planted, whether it was late. Um, but it's, it's varied around the state, what we saw for preventive plant acres. There are some epicenters I'll talk about a little bit. But I see that my crowd here today is conservation staff, uh, field agronomists from the co-ops. Um, those are most important people, of course. They give me really good information. Mike, that's good. And uh, I, I hope that we remember this because as we go forward, I don't want preventive plant questions every year. I want you guys to field some of those things because I think you have the ammunition, you have the knowledge, you have the experience locally to put a lot of these practices into play that, that are going to be really good for producers. Um, so as we roll into June, um, everybody's telling me a lot of acres, a lot of acres not planted. What are we going to do? RMA says you can plant a cover crop after your prevented plant insurance payment, and a lot of people took advantage of that. That number at the bottom is gigantic. That's the number of acres reported statewide. And uh, there is an epicenter um, out of Gamey County. Um, got hit pretty hard. That Green Bay area over there just was the bullseye for all the rainwater in the state. And there were really kind of two bullseyes. One was kind of hovering over Green Bay, and uh, one was over like Old Clare, Altoona area. So if you think you got a lot of rain, you were probably right. The whole state was above average. Um, so we had a lot of questions. Um, NRCS is an agency within FPAC, Farm Production and Conservation, under the US Department of Agriculture. And so our direct partner is Risk Management Agency. They, they have all the insurance guidelines for us to follow. Um, and they hand the technical stuff down to us because we're Natural Resources Conservation Service. And we work hand-in-hand hand with FSA because we share all the same clientele. So it's a really good kind of joining of all three agencies to work really well together. So we get a lot of questions. Um, hopefully producers work with you or work with NRCS staff to put a cover crop in if that was their choice. Otherwise, there are going to be some really bad situations, which I'm seeing right about now. So the first thing you should be asking that person is, what do they want? Um, that goes back to our conservation planning um, training courses. What's the landowner's objectives? What do they want? Do they want to just get the weeds under control? Do they want to maybe suck up some more water in the fall or have a little better planting condition in the spring? Obviously cover crops do about 10 or 11 different things that we can quantify and uh, erosion prevention, nitrogen credits, we got a lot of good options. Um, I'm wondering, you know, if you're working with producers, did they put something in that they intended to chop this fall? If they did, that September 1st date was critical. That's right about now. Hopefully, I think if I was short of forage, especially with some of the acres in the state of alfalfa acres, um, some farms lost most of their alfalfa just from the terrible winter we had, uh, up and down swings in temperature, five rain events that I can I remember that were about a quarter to a half an inch, just coated everything with ice and we were devastated in some areas of the state. So I think if I couldn't get my seeding done in the spring, I would have opted towards a forage crop, you know, sorghum sedan, BMR forage sorghum, or at least put in some late season corn silage that you could have chopped after that September 1st date. Previously, remember that date was November 1st, so you were really out of luck for getting much chopping done after November 1st. So in June, um, National Ag Statistics report was everything was wet and uh, everything was two weeks behind. And if you were in some area of the state, you were a month behind your planting date for some of these crops. So that's kind of the average. And uh, as we moved into August, 
it just didn't get any better until about mid to late August when the rains finally stopped. Some people got timely rains in August, which was nice for that new alfalfa seeding. Maybe it was in by August 15th, August 20th. So that leads us to where we are today. I'm happy to see a couple of those corn silage fields get chopped in this area, going from Jefferson to Eau Claire, Oshkosh, around the state, back over here to this corner, Richland Center. That's the first corn silage field I've seen go up. So that producer got a, maybe a shorter day variety in and got it planted and uh, it's making silage. That's good timing for the fall cover crop. Hopefully we get some winter wheat in the ground. And that just didn't change a lot. So late, late, late is where we're at. All the grain crops are just maturing slowly because we're seeing colder than normal temperatures. Uh, these nights in the 46 degrees this morning was pretty poor for uh, uh, helping your beans fill out and your corn to finish um, drying down. So where was the water? The entire state. Milwaukee? They were only five inches above normal in August. Or their, this is above normal precip. So uh, Madison was quite a bit higher, but the winner is, I think I gave it to you, the city, it's Green Bay. Green Bay in August was over 10 inches above normal. That's annual normal precip. And we've dried, we've dried down a little bit since the rain stopped in August, but only about a quarter to a half inch below those norms. So uh, that's, I'm not sending you anything new, but I'm putting it in perspective, you know, so combine late planting with a full season variety that needs a lot of heat, you missed hundreds of growing degree units and growing, de growing degree days if you didn't get anything planted until June 25th. So, you know, a corn silage variety that maybe needed over 2,000 heat units, you missed a bunch of that. So um, everything's just going to be late. So this was the memo, basically changing the November 1st. Um, chopping your cover crop as silage to September 1st. So I don't know about you, but I just haven't seen a lot of chopping going on here on cover crops around. So I'm not sure what producers actually decided to put in the ground and chop off. But I've been seeing some interesting things where people are planning for their, for their fall growth. So how bad is it? It's just spotty around the state. Some farms took their full prevented plant insurance payment and planted nothing and sprayed the entire farm and kept it really clean, kept the weeds down. Some farms didn't do that. Uh, they're suffering right now and trying to beat back the mare's tail and the giant ragweed and the seed bed from that is just going to be gigantic <laughs> weed pressure for, for future years. As we know, those seeds can live for decades in the soil. Um, this is a field next to uh, my house where I live in Columbia County. The soybeans were planted down to where it got wet. Soybeans suffered because we mudded them in in really wet soils and they didn't like it, so they didn't put a good root system down. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm seeing some yellow beans around the area. I think that's just a combination of being planted wet, shallow roots, disease, and maybe they're starting to senesce a little bit too. So that's just a combination of everything. So the sprayer got down and, and controlled it a little bit, but the sprayer didn't get into the lower portion of the field. So that's just going to be a challenge. Uh, I have been seeing the chisel plows and discs out trying to knock back some of that vegetation, but it's a tremendous amount of biomass on some fields, just the weed cover giant ragweed and just take over on some of them soils. So there's going to be a lot of work to be done. Hopefully producers can get in and maybe work that up and get a cover crop in this fall. Um, if you're just small pockets alongside the road, that's not bad. Um, Dodge County and over by Marshall and some of Dane County just have small pockets of the field. So uh, best guess is I bet producers are just going to wait till grain harvest and they're going to get in and disc that whole thing up. So it's going to be late, probably too late to plant something for a cover crop or a fall grain crop. So what I've got for you is um, two quick videos that NRCS partnered with UWNPM. And we're putting together the whole series of videos. If you saw the Wisconsin Crop Manager, Hi, I'm Barry Bubbles with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, an area GLRI coordinator working with the demonstration farms up in northeast Wisconsin. And so today we're out here in a field and we want to um, discuss and talk about how manure applications and cover crops can, can work together. The timing of the manure application is very important. So when we have these cover crops established, we want to wait for those cover crops to be a couple inches tall before we come back in with that manure application. That, um, that established plant then is going to have a lot better chance of recovering from the disturbance of the manure being injected into the ground. 
When selecting the species of cover crops, um, the best species to select are those that are going to be able to grow into the fall the longest and be able to recover from the manure application. So when we look at winter cereals, such as winter cereal rye, uh, winter triticale, and winter wheat, um, those are probably the three best uh, species for this system in Wisconsin. They're just going to give us the longest uh, growth and the best rooting uh, densities going into the winter. Another factor to take in consideration with manure and the timing of cover crops is maybe backing off on that maturity date of your corn. So instead of that harvest of silage occurring in late September, early October, maybe pushing that forward um, into the middle of September. So just giving yourself a couple extra days, couple extra weeks, and allow that cover crop to be planted and get established. Since we're recommending the cover crop to be established first, we need to make sure that the manure can be applied to these fields in a method that does not destroy the cover crops. And so several options exist for accomplishing that. One being a low disturbance injection and the other being a surface application to those cover crops. There's several different low disturbance toolbars that are out there on the market and it's very important that you evaluate and choose the toolbar that works the best for your farm and your soils while maintaining the goal of keeping your cover crop growing into the winter. For producers that choose to utilize a surface application of manure, evaluating the infiltration of the soil is key. And so fields that have poorer infiltration, the rates are going to need to be reduced. And for those fields that are in good shape with covers and a higher infiltration rate, we may be able to utilize a rate up of 7,500 to 10,000 gallons. When applying manure that has higher solids content, it's also very important that we adjust the rate on that so that we're not smothering the cover crop. Um, and distribution coming from the spreader is also a, a key factor to consider. This is an example of an excellent cover crop that had a manure app, a low disturbance manure application a couple weeks ago. Um, this winter rye is growing very well and is going to continue to thrive going into this fall and winter. It's offering excellent protection to the soil surface and, and retention of nutrients. Um, next spring, this winter rye is going to continue to grow and this field will be an uh, excellent candidate for no-till planting. In summary, manure can be applied to a cover crop. It's just important that we keep in mind the application rate, the timing, the method, and the species that we plant. Hello, I'm Brian Brisky. Um, I work for NRCS out of the Altoona area office. Out here today doing some cover crop evaluations. Um, what we're going to be looking at just kind of some physical differences. What we got going on here actually is we got a couple different treatments. Um, this treatment over here is a continuous on my, my right is a continuous corn silage um, without a cover. Over here is continuous corn silage with a cover. Um, just a couple things before I even start digging at I kind of look at as I look at the soil surface here. Again, it's very smooth. I can see from the spring rains. Um, we probably had some sheet, a little bit of sheet movement here. This thing wasn't um, armored. I do see a few um, spots where we had some worms present. Um, over on this side, I have rye that's about six inches tall. Um, we're picking up definitely, I would say, visually a uh, higher, higher uh, worm activity. You got a mint in here, one here, one here, one here, one over here. So again, I see a couple different differences there. Next thing what I'm going to do is it's fork season. So I, uh, I want to empower anybody that has a fork in the garden shed. It's not quite potato season yet. Let's get out here, do some digging. So I'm going to dig into this ground here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call this, it's kind of, I call it the pop test. We're going to pop it, see what we got here. You notice this comes out in one big kind of clump here. On this side, I'm going to go in here in our row of cereal rye. Ah, got our little Velcro rip going on there. And I'm going to bring that over here. Now the thing that's interesting about this is, is we notice how easily this this just shatters apart and we got what I call a really tilthy or granular um, granular structure here. This is something that I want to really be trying to plant my corn into. On this side here, 
again I can see I have I have my big crust layer um, probably a weaker aggregate here where it got smashed down this thing here just it it doesn't break apart as as good as this as we can see this power of this rye root has definitely uh, created a different environment for us so with that being said um, I just want to just reiterate here with the with the rye it's not necessarily what's going on on top it's also what's going on underneath If you haven't seen all nine of those videos, that's some that's some good computer time uh, that was sent out um, in the crop manager a couple uh, months ago, and uh, just highlighting a couple of those simply because we're hitting on what we've got within our CS soil health initiative. Is these main main soil health properties is just try to minimize disturbance if you can, keep that soil covered if you can, and uh, developing a year-round living root system. It's just going to give I think producers quite a bit of benefits, and it's going to be kind of a all of all of us in the room to help producers or encourage them to move to that that system on their farm. Um, I, I get some comments about I'm just glad I had rye in the spring or winter wheat in the spring um, simply because it's sucking out that moisture in the spring, putting it up in the green vegetation and the tires of the tractors and stuff can float on that and uh, help enable some no-till corn planting into that crop in the spring. So um, obviously does some great things. Um, Agronomy Tech Note 7 was something I had a lot of questions on this spring, especially from insurance agents. Um, do you have to follow it? You do if you're getting cost sharing for the federal programs, anything through CSP or EQIP and those types of contracts. But you don't have to follow it by calendar date or seeding rates. You can have some fun with cover crops if producers are willing to try something new. I've seen some interesting blends come down the a line. I've even blended up a few recommendations for some of our arcs out there in the state. Rye and uh, and sedan grass rank very high. Techno 7 ranks 11 factors on these cover crops and rye is the second best cover crop. First best in ratings anyway, in high ratings is sorghum, sedan, and the hybrids just because of their root mass, their upright structure, their nutrient cycling, the disease and pest cycles that they can break in the soil, uh, the amount of biomass they create, Oats is right up there too, the close third. Um, as of today, it's September 5th. It's just getting a little too late to uh, get sorghum sedan in because you're just not going to have enough heat. Although I did see a couple 80s in the forecast. That crop needs a good 45 days of, of warm weather. So if that was planted in late June, um, my neighbor actually planted a pretty good amount of it. He got it chopped off already. So I'm pretty happy for him. And it's got a second growth coming back. He might get something off of it. But as of my best recommendations right now is those winter cereal crops. If you want something that dies, plant oats. See some great uh, flowing on oats in Dodge County and Fond du Lac County in recent years. And oats just creates a, it, it has the oleopathic effects, it has a smothering effect and nutrient cycling. Does some really great things for the soil. Um, so what about the manure? So here we are starting corn silage pretty soon. Um, we definitely want to get rye on. Refer to Tech Note 7 for some of the seeding rates. But if you're not actually putting your seed in the soil, you'll have to adjust the rates a little bit. Uh, I hear that there's getting more flying services lately. I'm not sure. I think they have to crank up the seeding rates a little bit on that. But refer to it for the seeding rates. And uh, spread the manure. So get the, get the cover crop seeded. Get some growth on it here over the next week or two. And then get the manure on. And then worry about your grain acres, of course. And those are obviously going to be late. I can predict we're still going to be shelling corn well into November, like we were in, in previous years. Snow might even be flying by then. And then book your tropical winter vacation and, and talk about what you're doing for soil health. Uh, things you don't want to do is spread manure on idle land. Snap Plus just throws up a whole bunch of red flags at you because you're not applying manure to meet the needs of a crop. Remember, we don't necessarily apply manure to fertilize a cover crop if it doesn't intend to be harvested. Um, things you do want to do is get your seed booked. I'm hearing good things that seed's available. So the other things we can be doing as uh, planters out in the field is thinking about what else that producer might need. Did they look at their soil test? Do they need to get soil tests done? Do they need to be planted for some lime? Is there erosion repairs that need to be done? I have been seeing waterways getting fixed. 
it's just getting cleaned out. Maybe they put in some paperwork to get some tiling and ditching done or redone, and uh, now's the time. Um, and I've always been a fan of getting more conservation on those fields as permanent vegetation, those edge of field buffer strips. Maybe it's just an area of the field the producer's just been fighting for so long and they're ready to put it in a permanent vegetated buffer strips or contour buffer strips if it's got some slope to it. The other thing to do, have a good conversation with landowners, is just how are you going to terminate that cover crop in the spring? Because for them to be able to plant corn or soybeans into that crop next spring, there's some termination deadlines for their crop insurance they have to be aware of. So it's not too late, but the F word is coming. Um, we want it to stay away as long as possible, but we have seen some light frost here, especially in these Richland County valleys. It seems like they don't get as much sunlight, the cold air sinks to the bottom of these valleys. But uh, October 15th to 20th is a good time to be thinking about them sub 32 degree temperatures. Um, and obviously, if you're just working with producers who want to get something in, get some fall oats in for the deer. Uh, triticale, they love triticale. And some of the research plots around the state, they can barely get triticale to grow because it's like a deer magnet. So <laughs> it's just super tasty. Uh, we are in this termination zone here of zone four. So in order to be an insurable crop for a producer next spring, if they're going to no-till into a living green cover next spring, they've got to get that killed um, within five days of planting or just before crop emergence. If their crop insurance agent comes out and sees corn about this high but the rise about this high, they may be violating some of their insur insurability of that crop. So, Other than that, this has been uh, some great stuff from northwestern Wisconsin. People aren't following Tech Note 7 at all. This is a mix of about 14 species this guy's been practicing. And he says, the heck with it, I'm throwing the whole cookbook in there. There's brassicas in there, there's clover in there, <coughs> sorghum sedan, uh, all kinds of stuff in his mixture. And very specific varieties for, for grazing and meat production or even dairy. Um, we're just a little too late to get that kind of vegetative growth this time of year. But if a producer planted something earlier, they could have something grazable into the winter, which is kind of fun. So that's what I have. Any questions for Mike? Sure. So, I <clears throat> just wanted to show you on the back of your packets, um, there is a information if you had manure that went on in the spring and then they couldn't get planted, um, <clears throat> you're looking at the crops to pick and snap plus under number one, probably going to have to have flags and explain those flags. But the rest of them are options for putting manure on and then having a uh, fall seeded planting or a late planting and harvesting it like as a forage so the manure can actually get used. And that shouldn't be. So at this point in the season, are there any co uh, cover crop cost share options through NRCS? So through NRCS, if you were going to get cost share, you would have had to have a contract last year to get some cost share to put cover crops in this year. Um, you won't want to check with your local office if you can sign up for something yet this year and implement something for next year. So planning six to nine months in advance is completely critical. So yeah, no, otherwise you'd be doing it out of the kindness of your heart and uh, opening your pocketbook a little bit for, for soil health. <laughs> yep, so great. Thanks everyone. When it comes to the CAFO side, this is what my role is within, so 590. Um, you know, there's some probably some parallels, but this is more so to cover CAFO specifics. But some considerations would be over applications that happen should have a cited explanation to allow for understanding when we're reviewing plans. So please make sure that um, you allow opportunities to share your story about that particular operation. So we're not going into that review kind of flying blind, so to speak. Um, you're going to be able to use the narrative as a place to highlight circumstances. There's going to be fields where things didn't get planted, there might be over applications, those are, those are going to be things we're going to have to be um, understanding of, but don't not explain it either. If um, you also can please utilize the compliance check area as a means of making sure there's an explanation by any kind of a cited over application or a unique circumstance due to this year. Um, so if anyone has any questions on this, I will be around after and would be happy to answer any further questions. And then implications on compliance, some consideration understanding, like I said, will be given. I, we will ask you if we have questions. If we see a lot of over applications or just some really weird things going on, 
and there's no explanation, we're, we're probably going to be contacting you. Um, that's normal with the review for a reissuance, especially if we see something, it, it needs to have a valid explanation. Compensating and crop year to come, nutrients may carry over that weren't completely utilized, so be kind of looking at this with the farmer and um, looking at their cropping rotation to see if you can most efficiently utilize those nutrients that maybe you weren't able to utilize because that crop didn't get in. Um, verifying background end or secure validation of other nutrient concerns, PSNT, tissue analysis, things like that. If you're going to be using that in the time to come to um, maybe verify what end is left over, please make sure that if you're going to if it's going to kind of put things off in SNAP Plus, be supplying the lab reports so we kind of know where you're at. We'll see someone say, we had a PSNT value of this, so therefore this is our adjusted end recommendation. We need to see those lab results submitted with your annual reports. Um, and then there could be implications for not just this season. So just keeping that in mind um, that, you know, continue to provide those explanations so we know what's going on in that operation. So keeping it pretty general, um, it's more or less tell your story and be descriptive and make sure that you just substantiate what's going on. And a few people have asked me, do you want like just one big blanket explanation or do you want it in those explanation boxes that show up on the compliance? I can't stress the importance of that because as things go, it's really hard to sometimes, you know, those one blanket statement explanations sometimes people insert on the PDF on that compliance check don't always, you know, the explanation in SNAP Plus will carry with it on the compliance check. So utilize that as your format. So, um, any questions for me? Um, the first one is um, we've updated the soils this year. Uh, the last couple of years we haven't, uh, haven't done that. So you may notice some changes in some of the soil properties that you download. Um, so you, you'll see those when you uh, bring them down in the SNAP Plus uh, desktop app. So you'll see like different color changes. So you may see some of those, so don't be alarmed with that. Um, some of the other things that we've done, we've added a couple different features for snap, uh, snap maps. One was an annotation feature. So a lot of times uh, people wanted just to put a, some text on the map that would label something that they couldn't do with uh, some of the other uh, features. So under drawing tools, uh, we have a draw feature and we have something called an annotation. And when you click that, you'll get like a little blue dot. Um, what that does is it's a place where you can put your, uh, your annotation. Um, when you click on that, it's going to bring up a dialog. You can enter in the, the uh, text that you want for your annotation. And then you can also put in um, the different font size that you want. And then also you can either, um, you can just have it um, at zero degrees or you can rotate that, um, that text a, different, uh, different, a couple different ways. So when you click that, slowly, slowly, okay, let's try that again. Uh, I did make some changes yesterday, so I think I might have broken something. <laughs> that is why this is the beta. Um, okay, anyway, so you see this right here? <laughs> that's why, oh, there we go. Fast internet. Um, that's why I love to do live demonstrations, just for entertainment. Um, we try to tell you. <laughs> uh, so you can you can also edit these features uh, if you go under drawing tools uh, edit features uh, click on annotation and when you click on them you feel like you should just click like anywhere in the front of it it's actually in the middle of it where it'll select it and then you can move that oops, you can move that that point and then you can also change the text um, the other thing that we've done is we've also um, made a change to the manure prohibited areas um, before people wanted to have them just uh, removed from the winter spreading and not also from the spreadable acres. So what we've done is we've added a way to select or to, to make a selection on which one you want. So when you draw a manure prohibited area, um, just draw the polygon, it gives you an option to change if you want it just for winter only or if you want it for all seasons. And that'll only come up when you do the, uh, the spreadable acres and the winter spreadable acres. You'll see that when you download that to Snap Plus. Um, let's see. Last thing I'm going to talk about is the PDFs. And actually, one other thing I forgot to mention before um, about the data. Make sure you upload and download your data this time with the new uh, the new changes, so that you get all that stuff in there. I forgot to mention that before. 
Uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about, uh, I said, was the PDFs. Um, I know the PDFs in the past are really bad. Um, you'd have a map, or you'd have a page this big, and your map would be like up here, and you'd have all this white space. So what I've done is I've tried to create a way that you can customize that, and you can move things around and expand the map. So it's it's much more uh, customizable, and I think it works a lot better than the old one. So under uh, create PDF, um, we have a couple different options. Uh, we have something called define a print area, and what you're doing is you're actually telling Snap Plus that I want to capture whatever is in a box that I draw. So I can click on that. It gives me a warning to tell me what I'm doing. So what I can do now is I can just click on the map and draw a box. And what I'm doing is I'm saying I want this to be saved as one of my options for printing. So it's taking a picture of that. I can actually add up to three different um, pictures that I can add to a map. So now I can go back up here and I can add another one. Let's say I just want to uh, let's have a little one up here. I can just click and drag, and there. And now what I can do to utilize those is I go to the PDF uh, creation, and I go to either the uh, winter spreading map, or I can do just a regular map. And when I click on that, I now have another option for creating uh, maps. We have our predefined one, which is the one that we've done in the past, or we've got the new one, which is use the custom mapping template. And when I click on that and hit done, Oops, I might have broken that too. What? No, that wasn't the right, that's not the right dialogue. Let me try that again. So quickly, I will draw my map. See, this is the other thing you don't do. You don't make changes the day before you go somewhere. I don't. I don't. I like to just make things more interesting. So let's try that again. You do you, Jim. Yeah. It really, maybe I gotta wait, because I think the internet's really slow here. Yeah. So, well, as I was talking before, to create a custom PDF, um, you have to define your, your print areas. Um, and you also have to make sure that you have pop-ups uh, open or uh, enabled for this uh, to work. So I'm going to draw my first one, and then I'm going to draw another one. And now I can go to create a PDF map, and I can use a custom mapping template. And what it's going to do, it's going to bring up my map. And now this is the first one that I did, and it's also, if you look at it, you can expand it, you can drag it, you can do all sorts of cool things, you can move the legend around, um, you can move this around, you can give the map a title, um, you can change the orientation, you can also add another map, I said you could add up to three different maps, so you can add another map, this is the clip that I took from the top, and I can also move that, so you can do a little inset, and you can also, again, you can move so we tried to make it so it's customizable. Everything is movable, and you can fill up the whole map screen. When I'm done, I can just hit Create PDF Map, and it'll get you'll get a, a PDF exactly of what you created. Yay! Yeah, you know, that's probably the most hate mail I get is from the PDF. So. <laughs> um, one other thing I just did add from I forgot to I added this uh, at the last meeting. Uh, there's a uncheck all area, uh, uncheck all layers except for the aerial. Um, someone wanted that so they could just reset everything and then um, start from scratch. So, quick question: How many people in the room use the daily log for the records, the 590 records? One, two, three. We've got a group back there. Okay. Is that because you don't need it? Or maybe you don't know how it works or what it's going to do to your farm. Huh? We personally, I didn't write the stuff, so I didn't know how it worked, and I was always afraid to use it. So we thought we'd take five or ten minutes and just kind of go through the easy way. I call it the happy path, in order to get the use the records import program to get the spread records into the program get them listed, and then actually bring them into your applications with the SNAP Plus models to make use of them. So I'm not going to go way down into the weeds on this. I'm just going to show you what we call the happy path. It's not really that complicated. Not as complicated as a 3D printer that isn't working. In SNAP Plus, or around SNAP Plus, let's say, there are really three places you can record your applications. You've got, wait, 
three. Why are there three? There's a reason, honest. You want to be able to document your nutrient management plan, so you use the nutrient application planner for that, right? So the applications go into there. You want to be able to record your apps as you're doing them, and honestly, Snap Plus is just not really the thing you want to use out in the field. It's a complicated program. We try to make it as easy to use as we can, but it's still not as sweet and simple as something like Excel. So we let you use Excel out in the field, just fill out a table. And finally, you want to be able to update your nutrient management plan. So you want to have really, there are three kinds of buckets for these things to be in. So we have three buckets in the program. Um, actually, one of them isn't in the program, it's in Excel or whatever other um, program you use for that kind of tabular data. There's the records screen in Snap Plus, or it's a daily log um, if you're a CAFO, planning a CAFO. And finally, the nutrient application planner is where the, the applications actually show up, get used by the models. So you want it to be here. You want that little actual checkbox made. So let's start at the daily log screen. I used um, the CAFO flavor here, daily log. The process is exactly the same for non-CAFO farms, for 590 farms. It's just some of the columns, column headers are a little different. So you click that daily record log file button there, and you get sort of an intermediate screen. I call this the funnel to the bucket. So this screen has a button, select file to import. You click that, and you get a regular row file picker. You'll note that I've got um, an Excel file selected here. Snap Plus will do comma separated values, CSV files as well. That's not on the happy path. If you use those, they're because of the way Microsoft wrote the code to go from CSV to Excel, you can have problems with uh, field names getting changed on the fly, that kind of thing. If you have commas in your field names, or like you have a list of drivers separated by commas, that can screw things up. So the happy path is just to use a straight up XLSX file. Import that, and the file name shows up there, and all the data in it it's in the right format. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, all the data in it show up in this table. And this is kind of cool because if you want to, you can actually edit it here. That's why I call it the, the funnel to the bucket. It's kind of hanging there for a minute. Before you stick it into the records bucket, you get a chance to play with this stuff. And there's a particular issue that I'll talk about in a minute that often you have to correct here. So then you click the import to snap plus button there, and it shows up in the screen. Boom. Now, now snap plus has a record of all those applications. Click the send to applications button down there, just accept all the defaults, get a little dialog box, click yes, that's the happy path. And now the application shows up just like we wanted it right there in the NAP. That's all there is to it. That's the happy path. It took me longer to explain it than it takes to do it in practice. If you've got the Excel file, it just shoots right in. That's the porcupines, by the way. Boy Scouts is great. Okay, so I'd be lying if I didn't say there are a couple of corner cases and ways to go wrong in this. What if your farm isn't a capo? Well, we already covered that. It's pretty much the identical process, just the file needs to be a little bit different. What if your spreadsheet doesn't have the letter for letter perfect names of the nutrient sources that are you got already in Snap Plus? That's where that funnel to the bucket comes in really handy. Because you remember when we first pulled in the file, it had all those new rows listed. You can edit that. Better than that, in a lot of places in Snap Plus, you can 
multi-select by control clicking, you can select a bunch of rows, right click on the header, and it'll pop up a dialog box that gives you all the possible values for that header, or lets you type something in if it's a, a regular number. But in this case, you know, you're, you misspelled the source when you were out in the field. So you select the, the rows that have that problem, right click on the source header, select the real name, and boom, they're in. If you want to edit the data after you do the whole import um, process, pretty much the same thing. Go into the records or the daily log screen, same kind of tools apply. You can fix it before you send the applications. Fertilizer and lime great for grazing. I don't know if you noticed, but there were tabs for those right there. It's just, again, it's just exactly the same process. What if you want to do number of loads instead of rate of application? Okay, well that, that's a little bit, a little bit more of an issue. So if you have a spreadsheet that has the number of loads column filled in, Snap Plus can figure that out and calculate the rate. Conversely, it can do the other. If you have rate filled in, it'll figure out number of loads. However, if you have numbers in both columns, something's going to go sideways on you. So just don't do that. Pick one or the other. If you have data for both things, just put them in two different spreadsheets. That's easy enough. Sort by those columns, split it up, paste it into two spreadsheets, do two imports. So if you're going to do that, make them one or the other. Don't mix and match. And in fact, when you're in the, uh, the record screen, the daily log screen, after you do the import, there's a button there that you can actually click. If you want to change numbers, you can change it as loads or as rate, but you have to pick to do that. So I, I mentioned about the format of the Excel files. We actually give you a starting place for that. Here are a bunch of templates. So here's one for fertilizer, um, spreading log. We have one for loads, one for rate. We have one for 590 farms and for CAFO farms. So if you click on this, this is in the help menu in Snap Plus, help reference docs. If you click on that and click on that entry, Excel, if you have it installed on your system, will come up with a blank file that has the correct columns, and all you have to do is type it in. And in fact, if you go to custom Excel templates, there are uh, a couple of options for doing, uh, it's not split up by loads or rate, but it'll actually come up with drop downs for your field names in the Excel, it'll generate an Excel file for your particular farm. Still more. Well, I already talked about custom templates, so not so much still more. Our good friends at um, NPM built an app that runs both uh, on iPhones and on Android platforms, so phones or tablets. You can download the uh, either from the app, app Store or Apple or um, Google Play for Android. And it brings up you can uh, obviously you set it up for your, your field and your farm, but then you can put in applications. Um, you can even set a location for it. And it will generate a spreadsheet file for you right there out in the field of all the applications that you've entered. And set that up so you can email it to yourself. Once you get to your desktop, you can suck that spreadsheet right in. Some other issues, um, there's this guy, unchecked only versus send all. The happy path is to just leave that alone. And what that means is whenever you send something to Snap Plus um, to the Nutrient Application Planner from here, it'll check this box for you that it's been added already as an actual application. But you can imagine when you're trying to redo something or you wanted to delete an application and send it again, sometimes it's a problem. You want to be able to just send everything that's on the, on the page all at once and not have to bother with checking and unchecking. 
most of the time you don't have to worry about that. Again, this guy, um, this little dialog box that I said always click yes. What this, I think this is one of the pain points that people don't really know what's going on. But what it does is it, if you can't read the text there, it says replace planned applications with same field, crop year, season, and source. What it's doing there is it's looking in the records in the nutrient application planner that match the, the record or daily log item that you're about to uh, send to SNAP Plus, send to the NAP. And it looks to see if they match. And if they do, it'll say, aha, now I know that was a planned application. This is an actual application. I'll just delete the old planned one and stick the actual one in. Easy. But again, you can imagine some cases where you might not want to delete the old planned app, and so we gave you an option. You can, if you want to, you can click no, and it'll just duplicate everything that was in there. Um, it'll, the new applications won't overwrite, they'll just interleave. The happy path is to always click yes. And finally, why the heck can't I edit these numbers when that's checked? The idea was that once you send it to SNAP Plus, once you send it to the NAP Nutrient Application Planner, that's real data, that's real applications. And we didn't want people tweaking the numbers in there. Instead, if something is, needs to be updated here, you have to go back to the records page, the daily blog page, change it there, and send it again. Again, the happy path, you usually don't need to do that. We're going to talk from now on about some of the new features in the desktops, NAT Plus version 19. Um, I'm going to tag team some with Sue and Joe. I'm going to start with what I think might be the most useful um, new feature for most of you, and it's the filled in in 590 checklist. We have a new report in the reports menu. It's in a bait, it's the 590 checklist. When you run that report, it pops up the fillable Word document of the checklist, and it also puts that checklist in your reports files. It'll fill in the, the farm information that you have in there, and it will also fill in the consultant's information that you have in there. Um, it still has that box at the beginning of each section where if you have problems, this one up here, or you need to tell the person who's reviewing the checklist why some of the answers were no. Um, you can write that answer in here. And then from, that, from this point on in the checklist, if you have any, um, if you don't have any manure in your plan, there'll be all of the questions that relate to manure will just be in a. So now I'm going to run through each of the, the check boxes and talk about them and explain what the logic is in SNAP Plus that's going to make them be yes or no or NA. And the first one is having all your, your nutrient recommendations based on soil samples. If you have a soil test for every field that's listed in SNAP Plus, you're going to get a yes for this one. So, and then the next one is the one about whether the soil samples are at the correct density or they're not too old. So for that one, you're going to get a yes as long as you don't have any um, soil test problems listed on your compliance check reports when um, you run it. So that's going to give you a, a yes. Now, 
after every one of these slides now, I'm going to stop and Sue's got some questions for you. So, I don't know about you guys, but have you ever heard that the 590 standard is not a water quality standard, it's an Abrams Avionomics standard? Well, I've heard it once many times. So as we go through this, each item, I want you to tell me, is that an agronomic standard or is this in here for water quality or both? So on 1A, where we determine this, uh, that we have, we need soil samples from a certified lab. Do you think we do that just for agronomic reasons, or is it also related to water quality? Both. Okay, both. And B, I will mention too. If you look at that last sentence on B, it's about having pasture. So we need to, we need to account for all the manure that's produced on the farm. Okay, so pastures are part of that. They're being spread by the animal, not by the mechanical means, but we have to count for all the manure produced. So if you haven't started planting pastures, you need to start planting pastures for this fall and for 2020. So you can use a default soil test. That's 150 part per million soil test P, and you can use the 6% organic matter, and that's written there. You don't have to go the code and look at up not in the 590 standard. So for B, then we soil sample it every four years, every five acres, and we follow A2809, and we follow 590. Is that agronomic, water quality, or both? It's both. It is both. So there we go. So one C is the checkbox about whether this is for siting. Um, so snap loss is always going to assume that it's not uh, for siting. It's going to always put in A. I should emphasize that this is an editable document. So anytime it's wrong, you, you as the planner go in and edit it. So on the rare instances that we're doing plans for siting, just change that to yes. Um, and then the next one, D, is about whether all the fields are mapped. Whether they have, they've got the acres and the location. So if you have field boundaries in snap maps, if on your snap map screen you've got a <coughs> multi-polygon in every one of those rows, then it's going to be yes. What do you think is going to happen if you're not using snap maps for, for mapping? I know some of you use other programs. The program isn't going to know that it's mapped, so it's just going to say it's just going to say nothing. It's going to leave it blank if it doesn't know that you've mapped it. So you'll just have to go in and put the yes in there yourself. So for C, with livestock siting, that we let them have a year to get their soil test done, or they assume a soil test P of 100 parts per million, is that agronomic water quality or both? Both, that's fine. Uh, identifying the field boundaries, the acres, the location, so we can get the soils, so we know what issues each field has, what's that? Agronomic, water quality, or both? Both. So, B e is about following A2809 recommendations in your applications. So, the program is going to look for nitrogen excess um, or uh, in excess of recommendations, nitrogen excess um, of what's allowed on legumes or commercial fertilizer applied in excess over the rotation. And if you don't have any flags for that, you'll get a yes. There's one more A2809 recommendation that's um, gonna, that has already tipped some people up. Um, in A2809, when they're talking about the starter, Fertilizer, the extra starter, the 20 pounds of nitrogen and the 23 pounds of PQO5 that's um, allowed for corn. 
that is intended to be applied over or close to the seed subsurface and at planting because that's the way the recommendations were developed. So if you have this starter applied as unincorporated and you've already um, exceeded your other nitrogen recommendations for corn, you're going to get this message, which you can't read right now, but it says, in applied and started the corn should be applied at planting and placed subsurface with or in a band in close proximity to the seed. Has that tripped people up already? Okay. Um, so it's just going to, as long as it's applied subsurface and in the spring, you'll be fine. <laughs> so what's that one? If it's not subsurface and you've already exceeded the rest of your nitrogen recommendations or your regular nitrogen application, so it's going over that recommendation, then it's going to say it can't be starter because it's not subsurface. Because that's the definition of start starter. It in actually it's in the 590 standard now. It's at um, apply the planting and place subsurface with or in a band in close proximity to the seed. So you'll see a zero recommendation for corn on the phosphorus a lot, and the only a, amount you can have is 23 pounds per kilo five above that. So that's when you're going to have to check that subsurface, and not necessarily at planting as long as you have the string. But now you can set up your system to have at planting, post planting, pre plant. Yeah, and the, the agronomic reason for that is that you're not really going to get that benefit of that starter if you broadcast it. That little bit of extra at planting. Oh, is that agronomic water quality or both? Louder? Both. So the next one is about not making any winter applications of phosphorus and potassium fertilizer. That's always going to be a yes when you've done your plant and snap plus. Do you know why it's always going to be a yes? Has anybody ever tried to apply fertilizer in the winter and snap plus? There's no winter in the nutrient application <coughs> planter for fertilizer. If you succeed, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> and the next one is about a whether you've documented how you calibrate your equipment. Now we've tried to make this as easy as possible for everybody. As long as you have documented any of these methods, in the spreader calibration in the calibration box that's on the farm screen, then you're gonna get a yes. Yeah. So F, where we don't winter apply fertilizer, is that agronomic water quality or both? Both. Uh, document methods to determine our application range. Agronomic water quality or both. So this is the one about a a showing that you have adequate acreage to apply all of the manure that's produced on the farm. And this is a little complicated. SNAP Plus is going to make sure that you have no more, um, you've applied no, no only, um, let me get this straight. <laughs> Your manure production in Three years in the plant cannot be more than 10% over what you plan to apply. So we give you a 10% cushion between what you say you produce and what you say you're going to apply. And it's going to look at the, the current year, the prior year, and the next year in the future. So you're going to have to plan some applications in the future if you 
uh, manure production. And I'll show you how this is going to work. So in the plan year, um, in this example, they have three manure sources entered. Um, one's liquid and two are solid. And then this is shows the, some of their applications for each of those three sources. And then this is what's remaining. Everybody knows how to find this in SNAP Plus. It's in the nucleate, Nutrient Application Planner and also in the table that um, nutrient applications by season. Uh, so in this case, there was some remaining, but it's about 5%, so that's fine. It, um, it's under our 10%. And then they overplanned because they have a negative um, remaining for the two solid remorse. So that's fine. If you look at last year, in the, then the same, same, same sources, a little bit different, no annual volumes. When they, this should be record, so what they actually applied um, um, was less, was more than what they had available. So they probably under reported their available, but it's still fine um, because the program is over looking for overages. And in the next year, same sources. Um, and in their, this would be their planned applications. They over planned for the liquid a little bit and this first solid. But they underplanned for this one solid here. And that turns out to be more than 10% of that source. So in this case, that would throw a, a no for the whole um, checkbox because they were underplanned for that one source in one year. So in this case, what you would probably do is, if you got a no like that, you'd go back and look at all of your your known annual volumes and what you applied and see if there's some problem with what's entered um, in any of those places. And know that if you have, if you're missing the known annual volume for any source in any year, or if you don't have applications in any in any of those three years, then it's going to just leave it blank. Any questions? Uh, any questions? Um, is there a spot somewhere where you can show where they exported? If they have that remaining. But they exported it to a neighboring farm who owns their own plan. Because otherwise, you're going to get a no so, check there, but they really. Yeah, but so that known annual volume is the known annual volume that the planter, the planner, the planner enters on the nutrient sources screen. If they're ex exporting manure, then they should enter the volume minus that export. And they should explain that they've exported somewhere in the farm narrative or in the annual notes. But that known annual volume that's entered should be what the planner thinks is really going to be available to spread on the farm in that year. Now go the other way too if they're importing. If they're importing, exactly, yeah. Thank you. Was it hydronomic water quality or both? Both. Okay. So you need to use one of the phosphorus strategies on all of <coughs> your farms. The P index or the soil test P strategy. So as long as you have Nothing in your um, in your compliance check report that's a rotational restriction problem um, that's related to soil test P strategy, you're going to get a yes. And you should know that this um, report, the, the checklist report, is going to have a 
in the setup box, it's going to have a place where you can enter which strategy you want to use or both if you want to. And similar to the, the P index strategy or SWIFT SP strategy question, there's a question about whether you need tolerable soil loss in all fields. And again, if you have no rotational restriction problems in your um, compliance check report, that means that you, all of your fields met T, and you get a yes. For those two, let's go with the first one. Is the phosphorus assessment strategy agronomic or water quality? Both. And uh, using a complete crop rotation with a critical soil, probable soil loss rate, agronomic, water quality? So this is a little tricky too. This is the, the question about whether you have untreated gullies or ephemeral erosion and you're, you, should, you shouldn't be applying to fields that have those untreated problems. Usually this is going to be blank. Why do you think that would be? We don't know program won't know um, if you've got those gullies or, or ephemeral erosion unless the planner has entered them. So if you have entered in the field, if you've been drawn on the map a gully or ephemeral erosion or if you've entered in the field problems um, box from the field screen that there is an, um, something like a gully or a erosion channel um, and it's not been there's nothing in this year fix box uh, then you're going to get a no but that's the only time you'll get anything on there um, has anybody has everybody seen this field problems box <coughs> no no yeses or nos or you know, if you draw if you draw a gully or ephemeral erosion channel in Snap Maps, and when you import it, that information will go to this field problems box, and the year that it, it gets imported will be the start year, and it'll it'll be open until you type in that it's closed, that it's fixed. And then there's this. There's a, um, three in a row of check boxes that have to do with conduits, direct conduits to groundwater, wells, or uncropped areas that can't, where you can't apply nutrients or you can't apply um, manure. And those will always be blank. And it's the same reason as before. Snap. Plus, doesn't really know if you've marked all those, if you mapped all those. But if you have mapped all those areas, then as a planner, you put yes in all in those areas, and, and you put yes here. And why would that be? If you marked them on the map, you you always say that you're not applying manure in those buffer areas. I know. That's because SNAP Plus takes those buffer areas, takes those nutrient prohibited areas, and removes them from the spreadable acres. So it doesn't really let you plan manure or, in some cases, fertilizer in those areas. Okay, so for K, when we talk about ephemeral erosion and preventing gully erosion, is that agronomic or water quality? What about uh, that we're not applying within eight feet of an irrigation well or where we don't remove vegetation? How about 50 feet we're not applying uh, around those 
conduits for groundwater. And untreated manure has to be applied uh, within a thousand feet of those community wells or hundred feet of public. Do you think that they are not it? Don't start back? No. Water quality. All three of them. So this one is about not making um, applications in areas that have been locally delineated as um, contributing direct runoff to conduits of groundwater. Uh, most of the time, that's going to be in it because there are only two counties in um, in all of Wisconsin that have those layers, the locally delineated layers, where you need to um, incorporate manure. Um, and those two, those two counties are in this area, the Kiwani and Manitowoc. So you, if you're planning in those counties, you're going to run into them. Um, and if you do have a field that intersects one of those layers, um, then it's going to be blank because you're going to, as a planner, are going to need to say that it's been planned to be incorporated within 24 hours. Checkboxes that have, have to do with all of the requirements when you're using commercial nitrogen on highly permeable soils and when you're spreading manure in the fall or late summer on soils that have a high leaching capability. And I'm not going to read all those. Um, it's very straightforward uh, what the checkbox is doing. If you run your um, compliance check report, and there's no problems related to nitrogen applications on highly permeable soils or soils with high water tables or soils with shallow bedrock, then you're fine, you're going to get a yes. What's that? Agronomic, water quality, or both? This is we're talking about the, the SWICMA and the conservation um, measures you need to, to use when you apply unincorporated applications of manure in the SWICMA during the fall, spring, and summer. And <laughs> SNAP Plus, you probably already know, it goes through and, and checks um, what it can check. Um, and in, in most situations, your applications will meet um, one of these strategies. Um, in some cases, you'll get a guidance message that says you need to um, apply the manure right around planting. Um, and so, but the plant is still good. And then in a few instances with fall applications, you'll get um, a compliance message that says that you really can't meet one of these strategies with that application. So as long as you don't get this, the compliance message, you're going to get a yes in your checkbox. Um, the guidance message is OK. That's considered to be part of your plan. The next one down is about the, the limit on liquid manure applications in the SWICMA or, or in tiled areas of 12,000 gallons per acre. And that's also very straightforward, no compliance problems, you're going to get a yes. So, what do you think? Agronomic or water quality that we're limiting rates in these vulnerable areas? Water quality. Now we're going to go on to section two. And section two is about winter manure application strategies. And 
These first two, A and B, are always going to be blank because they're about determining whether you've got enough storage or land to apply in the winter and that you've shown where the storage capacity is. So what you're going to need to do or want to do is look at your winter spreading plan. Um, that winter spreading plan will mark out how much manure you would have would it produce in 14 days or 120 days? And we'll have your storage, um, more, and we'll have your storage volumes. And you can see in this case, your storage is 20 for the manure that's produced. And then it will also document where you plan to apply manure in the winter. And in this case, they didn't apply plan to apply manure in the winter at all. But they still need to show that they've got 14 days worth of storage, I mean, of um, available land. So at the bottom of that table that shows where you apply manure in the winter, there's this list of fields that say these fields don't have manure applied and they have absolutely no restriction of any kind of winter application. And this particular farm is really lucky. They've got a number of fields and, um, that don't have winter restriction, restrictions and don't have manure applied in the winter, and it totals 570 acres. So that's plenty for their 14 days of, of production. And for that second question about documenting your storage, including stacks, um, one thing that people may not under, uh, know is that you can go ahead and if you've got stacks, you know that you can map them where you're planning to put stacks and stamp maps. But you can also go ahead and list them here um, in your storage table in the manure production estimator um, as what you think the storage capacity be, how many times you'll need to use them for deer, and then that will show up here in your manure storage on your winter storage, winter spreading plan. And I think Sue has some things to say about that. So, so I don't know how many farms that you see where they maybe have a bedded pack in the barn all winter. Make sure that you count that as a storage because that's manure that doesn't have to get mechanically applied in that 120 and if they're grazing out, say they're, they're, I see it around me where the cattle will be on corn stalks and they'll be out there much of the winter and they're grazing out there. We need to count that as winter grazing. So you need to make a herd and apply an application to that corn field or whatever it's going to be the next year um, as a grazing application. So those actually are going to be some of your easier winter applications to make because you have less on those grazing. They can be near wells because they need water. They can be near swim holes. And you just have to meet the rest of the standards with your phosphorus assessment and your rodent. So when we look at A and B, when we're planning the quantities of winter spread manure and when we're figuring out the capacity of our storage, what do you think those are? Agronomic or water quality? Cool. Thank you. So this one, C2C, is, a, is about not making apple, winter applications in the switch months. And that's always going to be a yes if you've got field boundaries in drawn and snap maps. Who knows why that is? It's because <coughs> SNAP maps is going to identify those as winter manure prohibited areas. It's gonna when you import, it's gonna go to your in your federal acres that you have only a part of the field is winter spudle. In this case, 
This field is 6.3 acres, but only 1.5 acres of it is spreadable in the winter. And when you start to enter your manure applications for the winter, and you pick, so here's a, a winter manure application on this field. It, it's unincorporated, obviously. Pick spreadable. It's only going to apply to the 1.5 acres. That's all the manure application that's going to count. So if you want to go back um, and apply the, to the rest of the field in another season to get an even application, you go in, you pick say, another season, say spring, and then the area you pick is winter manure prohibited. And it, that will give you the rest of the acres on the field, and you can plan to even out the field application. Has everybody seen this before? Does everyone use it? We use it, but you're not. So think about always having the pairs for that winter application, either in the fall or in the spring. So would this be agronomic, water quality, or both? To show and make our application in the sweat The water. Yes, we had both answers on this. Water or both. There are some areas that are required where you're required to not apply in February and March. You can apply in the winter, but not in February and March with liquid manure. Um, this is a region that has those areas. The areas that are less than five foot of bedrock over Siluria and Dolomite are areas with, um, where DNR has paid to, for people to redo their wells. Those, as long as the, all the fields have boundaries, this is either going to be a yes or an NA. If you're in an area that doesn't have any of those kinds of like no Silurian dolomite and no well compensation areas, then it's going to be NA. But if you've got fields in those areas, then it's going to be a yes because those areas are all mapped. If you, you're going to get an indication of those field restrictions. And it's going to give you a guidance message as part of the plan that you can't apply there with, with, with liquid manure in February and March. Any questions on that? So this is what's in 590, not what's in 151.75. So, agronomic water quality or both? Water. This is about the 300 foot buffer around direct conduit to groundwater during the winter. And again, if you've got these, these wells or other direct conduit to groundwater <coughs> map and you've got field boundaries, then it's going to it's going to be a yes there. Because SNAP plus takes those, those areas drives that buffer and removes that buffer from the spreadable acres in the winter. So in this case, this field only had 2.6 acres available in the winter, and now it's only at more than five feet. Agronomic water quality or both? Both, are you saying, or water? I got water. So there's three different checks on phosphorus and rate that you need to, that are applied for winter manure that you can't exceed the crop removal of, of phosphorus or the next coming, upcoming crop. You can't uh, apply more than 60 pounds of PQO5 equivalent, and you can't apply more than 7,000 gallons per acre. So as long as you don't have any um, compliance issues, that's straightforward, you're going to get a yes. 
relationship. So on F, that we only limit our that we limit our winter rain. Is that agronomic, water quality, or both? Water. I have both, but it's a new water. But you're limiting your rate, so we're not going to see much out there. You see our runoff. So I'm going with The last one, um, this, and it may be one of the most confusing and complicated. This is about whether you, you're meeting at least two of the allowed practices if you have, for application when you have fields that have concentrated flow channels in them or have a slope greater than 6%. And the answer here is, is if you don't have any compliance messages related to those two, two things, to concentrated flow channels or slopes greater than 6%, then you're going to get a yes in this checklist. Um, but I'm going to go through a, a, one example just so you can see how the program is working. This, in this case, this is a field with a, a concentrated flow channel. It's an intermittent stream. I wanted to show that intermittent stream as a concentrated flow channel because sometimes people, when they import, they get a concentrated flow channel restriction and they didn't draw it. And so they, they were confused. So intermittent streams are automatically <coughs> considered concentrated So if you're, when you're applying manure in the winter to this field, you would go and look at this winter practices button. Has everybody looked at that? Okay, maybe. Um, and if you have looked at it, you know that it'll pull up a list of applicable practices for that field. And if you're already following practices, just in your normal pl planning, it'll tell you what those practices are. And you can check them or not. It if you're following pra two practices already, even if you don't check them, it won't give you a compliance flag. But if, you're, if you check practices and, then, and you don't follow them, then it's going to give you a compliance flag and tell you that you're not doing what you check. One thing I want to tell you about that's new with these practices is this one. C, if you, if you apply, if you check that you're going to apply an intermittent strip on no more than 50% of the field, then SNAP Plus is going to cut your winter spreadable acres in half automatically because you said you're only going to apply to 50% of the field. Questions about that? Sue? Oh. <coughs> water quality, or both? somebody say that the 590 standard is not a water quality standard. You can bend to this. I mean, I hope you tell them because you're all as much educated as you're bending about something. Um, yeah, it's yeah, you can yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, just the last one, we had a little issue with the electronic signatures, right? But that actually is quite legal if have a tight hand signature on this. It's state law. We do have a tight hand. So um, go ahead and do this. If the agronomist is doing that, the whole point of this section is that you discuss the plan with the farmer. So the farmer knows where they're putting what and that you're just not handing off a paper plan. Okay. And we find we, we'll see that when we review the update doesn't kind of match and it's confusing the standard. So just some quick review. 
that will go back into our checklist here. So can you explain why this field has a plague in 2019 and not in 20? So up here, you have the same fertilizer ash, and down here, the same fertilizer ash. And what it's saying is your uh, spring and summer end fertilizer applications on this field do not meet the requirements for highly permeable soils. Use one of these, nitrification inhibitor with ammonia forms of nitrogen, slow release nitrogen, or split the application. So when you look down here, there's no play. So what did they do different? Unincorporated the manure application. It's actually here, and I didn't catch it. It's urea got put on in the summer, and that was all it took. Yet more than 50% of your urea applied after planting. So just watch that. Another one you might have, uh, can you explain how to fix the plague? So <laughs> the field is in the swigma, and it says we have one or more applications not compatible with none or no till selected for this crop. So they're incorporating it. Does incorporation work with no till? No, you're not really no tilling. So what would unincorporated manure do in the slick mop? What's our rate? Yep, we're limited to 12. So if we left it at 16,000 gallons, then all of a sudden, um, our liquid application is too high and it would seize. You could go 12,000 and then come back with four a week later when it's drier. What about some of these low disturbance well, applicators that- Well, uh, here you go. If you inject, oops, if you inject, the problem is we're capturing more of that nitrogen and now we're blowing the standard because we've got 11 pounds extra N on there. Oh, but what happens- Because you're not volatilizing as much nitrogen. And injection works with no-till. It will calculate a little more soil loss, but it is something you can use with no till too. Anybody work with the P trading? We had somebody from who was up here at one of the other sessions. So just know when the P trading is done, you can run those reports. You'll see it if you go down towards the bottom of the reports, but they're working off the predominant soil of the field. So we're not over exaggerating how much phosphorus is actually getting. Uh, control there. And just because I get tons of questions about what these tillages mean, know that on the cropping screen there's a blue link and it takes you right to the explanation for the tillages. And if you have a really weird tillage guy who thinks he's completely different than the rest of the world, you can click on this and get to these stir tables where you, Laura can tell you more about it, but how I look at it is you can see how bad moldboard is and you can compare it to no-till and then you can start looking at all the differences in between. Like some of those vertical tillages turn into, you're not quite sure what to pick. But really, you know, the fall chisel no disc is two passes, fall chisel disc is a three pass. It explains all that. So the farmers can take the best one. Okay. I think Joe is up. Good segment. Someone's focused there. So this is the last set of slides. We're going to finish up talking about our new features. I'm going to hand this off to Joe in just a minute. But I did want to tell you that there are new, some new crops added to version 19. There's no completely new crops. Sorry, Christmas trees didn't get any. There this time um, next year, I hope. Um, there's some new double crops and there's some more choices of cover crops. I don't have a slide for that, but there's also a lot more crops that have vertical tillage. So when you open up the program, look into what's new and then we'll say where, what all the new tillages are. I did add one completely new tillage. Um, it was at the request of some of the counties. It's no-till green, and that's for use when you've got a cover crop or some kind of perennial crop and you just plant directly into it. I have to say that it's not perfectly representative of what people would probably be doing in the field because there was no way I could make 
a management in Russell too that I could figure out that would kill the cover crop after planting. So, because if, if it kills the crop, cover crop after planting, it kills everything. So, it it's, kills the cover crop on the day of planting. So, it's, um, it, you would, you're not getting quite the soil loss benefit out of this as you would if you were, if I was able to make it correctly and it would kill it some a few days after planting. As Jim said, <coughs> we updated the soils um, from the NRCS soils database. Um, please do upload all of your to snap maps and download again and import again you will see some changes um, it's not as much as it was a couple of years ago but there will be some changes and sometimes if you're wondering if you're getting a different soil loss calculation or something seems funny um, and it, you're wondering if it's because they changed the erodibility or something else in the description of a soil then you can go to the SNAP Plus website and look under planning information um, and it's the 2019 soils details aren't up there yet this is what we had for 2017 and 2018 um, there's a, a link to a spreadsheet that's sortable by county that tells you all of the soil changes for all of the properties that we use in planning. And then there's another spreadsheet that tells you all of the, the values for all of the properties we use in planning, soil fertility and, um, and erosion calculation for all 9,832 9, soil map units in Wisconsin. And it's also sortable by county. So I just wanted people to know that it's there if they have questions. People use this at all? Yeah. Okay. Because of the new soils, and it's been mentioned, this was the third time, I guess, uh, you should upload your map data and then do a download. And that'll get the new soil characteristics, the new hydrology, Whatever has changed in the map from last year to this year. If you have, how many people here use the locked and verified uh, features on the fields page and on the snap maps? A few of you? That, <coughs> I'm still working on it, but that used to be an issue with the soils because you'd have to unlock your fields to get the soils to come in. If you have new soils on the, on the download. Now if you just hit the import button, if all your fields are locked, and you hit the import button, it'll prompt you and it'll say you have five fields that have soil differences. Do you want to import them? And if you say yes, it'll, they'll come in without affecting uh, the slope or the slope lengths or anything else on your fields. It'll just replace the soil. Otherwise, you'd have to go to the fields page yourself, unlock it, and, and uh, manipulate things. The other big change uh, Jim worked on quite a bit is the models run a lot faster. I'm guessing maybe two or three times faster. Uh, we had some problems with large farms that you know, they would run for a half hour, 45 minutes. And if it got close to the end, it might run out of memory. And so you have to work in groups and, and uh, make, make the data that you're working on much smaller so it can handle it. Uh, it's still a good idea to work in groups for other reasons, but I've tested this on a farm, fictitious farm with 1,700 fields with a fairly long history, and it didn't have any problems. I think the largest farm that I've seen in, in the state now is close to a thousand fields. So you should be able to handle that, but it's still good to work with groups and several farms. Um, 
but that will make it more fast. It no longer runs the models when you open the farm. So those of you that have large farms, you don't have to sit there and wait five minutes before it uh, runs all the new kids. This is the cropping screen. A typical cropping screen. We're just talking about a new feature about how you can insert uh, or paste rotation. And that's that button right up here. If you click on that, you'll get the uh, window that you might have seen before. And it's got a new tab over here. Insert rotation. But you may want to first create a rotation. Create a rotation, pick two or three years out of the rotation that's on the screen, and just click that. It'll uh, prompt you with a name, and it just takes the abbreviations for the crops that you have. You can make it any you want. And then you can save it. And after you save it, it can be used in the rotation editor. You can go edit it. You can go to the rotation wizard and use it to update other fields. And crops. You can use it all over the place. You can also use it right here when you insert rotation. What that allows you to do is take that rotation on the current field or any field that you've got. Say, I want to plop it right into the middle of this. So you slay where you want it to start. This was a seven year rotation. Say, I want to start in 2020. We'll put the first year of this rotation in 2020. Then overwrite everything after that. And you can choose to pick your you know, the rotation has nutrients, uh, plan, application, fertilizer plan. And, and that's what you get if you select this overwrite. If you don't select that, if you uncheck that, you're able to insert that rotation into the middle of your rotation. You might want to take a two, three year rotation, plop it into 2019 or 2018 wherever, not 2018, that's gone. But you might have had a crop that died, and so for playing next year, you might want to insert like a three-year rotation. You can do that. Select whatever rotation you want. Say, I want to insert it before 2020, or you can check this button and say, insert it after 2020. So it'll plop those years in, starting at whatever year you have here, and push everything else out into the future, okay? The next thing, we're back here in the NAP, the Nutrient Application Planner. Uh, a new button is highlighted up here in green that allows you to take what the applications that are on that screen and you can make a nutrient system out of it. How many of these nutrient systems? Yeah, this is an easy way to create. You can take an existing bunch of applications, make a system out of it, and then you create it. Uh, in the rotation wizard, the editor, you know, on this page, anywhere you add applications. Save you a lot of time. You could bring it in here if you wanted to into the nutrient systems editor and you could add applications to it or copy it to make, a, make another similar system for something else, change the name. You can save it to your shared database. So you can use that system on, a, on another farm if you're managing more than one. But there's a lot of ways to use that. The nutrient sources screen has changed a little bit. We used to have a, a grid for the dry fertilizers and a grid for the liquid fertilizers. We've combined them now, so you have more space, uh, so it's easier to work with. Sliding that slide bar back and forth so you have room to uh, edit these numbers. There's this column, the density columns per gallon, will indicate whether you're working with a liquid or a solid fertilizer. And then there's a new column over here, and I'm going to have to rename it. But that just shows you whether the fertilizer you have has an inhibitor or a slow release. Create those by uh, hitting the plus sign, selecting new fertilizer, and then create a fertilizer that has either or. Okay. 
if you're working with permanent farms and you've got a field with solarium dolomite, you, you have to, uh, when you do liquid applications, you have to apply them incorporated and, uh, or injected with a precursor. So if you don't do that, it will tell you down here that you have to have a precursor. You just click that little checkbox and it'll take that message away. And you also have to do the precursor. Laura's got a handout that if you want to know more about this, uh, they're here. Are they back there? They were back there. There's some back there. Yeah. But if you need them, just get a hold. Of them. The if you're managing a permitted farm, you've got a new button on the cropping grid. To get to the cropping grid by clicking this little button. If you're not on the cropping page, it'll bring you to the cropping screen. If you click it again, it'll bring you to this grid that lists all of the fields uh, and all your applications and all your cropping data for that year. How many people have used the cropping grid? Yeah, it's a nice place to go at it because you've got every one of your fields in there. I don't know if they have a clean uh, picture of it here, but you can, you can edit your crop, your previous crop, uh, you can edit your yields there. You can even click on these buttons over here and do applications. But you see all of your fields on one page. There's a cropping screen. You see all of your years uh, for one field. But back to the import yield. You click that, you get this dialog box, similar to a lot of our import um, functions. You can collect a file here. And, and we have that, we have templates for it that you can fill out. But you just put in your field name, you, you, uh, the crop that you're going to have, the crop acres, field goals, all of this data is going to be in the, in the Excel file. And then if you have, and, and this is for people that might be getting their yields information from their equipment, if they process it, they can take the averages field, you can get that data and pump it into Excel, and then we can just pull it in. This, uh, the only limitation here is you can only, if you have double crops, you can only import one of them at a time. So if you have a, a bunch of double crops that you are uh, harvesting in the summer, you could do, you know, create that import file, say you're Know, the harvest date, and then you're going to have, you won't have to do anything here because, because it defaults to the first crop. Uh, and, and then you can just fill in the data and you can import. In the fall, you'll be importing the double and second crop. So any field that has a double crop, you're going to have to go over to this uh, 82809 crop name, and there will be a drop down box that has two values in it. One will be the first with the double crops. Other than the second. So you select the second there, select the appropriate, appropriate yield, and then you can pull all that in. There'll be an indication on the cropping screen whether or not you, I don't have that picture here, there'll be an indication on the cropping screen of whether or uh, not the yield that's there is an actual we have a little egg or a plan. Uh, for those of you that don't use snap maps, are there any in here for their field boundaries? Okay, I guess there are only a few. Uh, but you can export your other GIS data into an Excel sheet, and you can import your spread boundaries. Same thing, it'll bring up a selection. You pick your XLS file, and it fills it right in. And Last one, which again is for permanent farms, well, only but both can use the, the uh, import yields is only, you're only going to see that if you're working on a permitted farm. This tab will be available whether you're a permitted farm or not. And it's just going to be filling in this uh, Excel sheet. Is it the internet or the way storage? 
over here you can list your basically it's your the pits that you would have on the uh, production estimator. You just list those here and put you know put the amounts of each one of these things in and just fill it in manually. Um, the NFCS table again you fill these in get a little bit more information in here. And once you have these, it will tell you whether or not you have enough data to store it. There's another radio button over here that says you want to use your hauling log data. That's pretty much going to take a five-year average of what you uh, the book of storage data applications that you made. The first time you come in there, and I'm still working on it, uh, you, it's going to be zeros and it's going to actually go through your applications that you made from your pits to look at that fill these numbers out. Okay. These, again, when, uh, I, well, fill these out. Here, so. On the nutrient sources page, you're allowed to associate a pit <coughs> or a storage name to a source that you have on the nutrient sources page. So if you have a liquid source of the nutrient sources, you can pull it here and say this pit is where that Stuff is going. So, so when you make an application with this, you're actually using that liquid storage. And those numbers uh, will fill in this grid. There's a button down on the bottom that I've covered up and I'm still working on it. But there's a button on the bottom that you can always just refresh those numbers. It'll go back to those five years and pull it out of your app. If you don't have your pits associated with a, a nutrient source, you're going to have to do it all manually. But that's new for this one.